Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's episode. A loneliness that never existed. And today's episode is honestly inspired out of something I noticed on that's going in going on in Japan. I saw a documentary. And it's called Hikikomori. And what's going on in Japan is that lives are becoming so in uh, internal that it's like the Hikikori is like they're modern day hermits. They're pretty much human beings who feel society is maybe unengageable or you can't engage it, inengageable, I don't know how, how you would say it. But anyways, I saw in the documentary the behind the scenes of the psychology of certain people who withdraw from the world. And for example, in one of them, by the way guys, those extra sounds in the back, they're insects. It's mind-blowing how loud they're. I mean, loneliness, of course, it is, um, it is something. I mean, we're all born alone, we die alone, actually, from the Buddhic perspective. Uh, to have companions <clears throat> is a luxury, it's a blessing, it's an advantage. But really, you have to master your solo walk in this world. And that's where style comes from, you know. So in Japan... A lot of these people who are modern day hermits, Hiko, hik, how do you say it? Hik, hikikomori, hikikomori. Now, one person, one of these hikikomori um, modern day hermits was saying something like a story that the poor guy had a um, high pitched voice. He was friends with all the girls in school, like at a young age, and then Sorry guys, there was a subtle interruption. Um, anyways, back to the hikiko, uh, go, go, uh. <laughs> the hiki hikikomori. <clears throat> anyways, the kid was saying pretty much th this kid. He was a young kid in school. Like they interviewed the father of this modern day hermit in Japan, and um, the kid pretty much got bullied in school. He had a high pitched voice. He was friends with all the girls. I don't know why that's an issue. <laughs> But, uh, you know, um, anyways, he was, there was a pressure that came to his mind that he could not handle. And the parent, the father was saying, suddenly the son stopped leaving the house. You know, first he would go out buying comics, then he would stop, and then he stopped leaving the house for years. That means there's some people in Japan who they haven't left their homes for years because their lives are being occupied by a more cyber space kind of ordeal where they're playing video games at night and, you know, in some sense life doesn't have really a meaning to work you see there's some people on this planet who i could tell you they're just existing and then there are some people who are living where they declare a value to the system that means if you do not give this a value if you do not uh men uh you do not see a shape to civilization you cannot even participate in <clears throat> now I would say personally, I mean, I've, I've had moments where I've been more focused on the work, but never in isolation to such a degree that society is forgotten, do you know? For me, my, I'll tell you something about my personal upbringing. I don't know, you, you may be someone from Japan listening to this. Um, 
in Persian culture, in Iranian culture, there is a sort of, um, I don't want to say artificial, but um, there are behavioral cultural attitudes that are just entertained for the sake of just language, do you know? Anyways, I just want to say I was caught into some artificial uh, behavior that wasn't me in my youth. And I, after some point, stopped identifying. I stopped identifying with an inefficient model to my life, you know? Terence McKenna says nobody knows enough to worry. That means if worry, if like fear is a reason why the person is not leaving their <clears throat> the house or whatever, you can say if you are afraid of fear, I mean it's like everybody on this planet is going to end. Everybody's afraid, you know. It's only when we separate ourselves in value. I think what goes on to people that they withdraw for the world is that the world, um, you can say perhaps it's an attempt. It's a sort of rejection of their inner realms. You know, a lot of communities, a lot of, just it's just the nature of the world, you know. We started from tribes, now we're more civilized, and as the tribe attained technology, it is now starting to see a sort of global emergence of behavior you know back in the day you can say it was just war like you could say people from different kingdoms would see each other and they'd be like who are you and they'd be like who are you and they'd start killing each other you know now it's like there's civility we have more respect for the intelligence uh than just you know a sort of physical calculation because there are moments for example uh, this Hikiko Mori if you look at ancient hermits they would go and live in a forest life there was a lot of spiritual people on this planet with that sort of banner um, um, with metaphysical orientation that you can say they roamed the earth they were never it's as if they saw themselves they're like all right I'm in a world time to move time to see what's going on you know, it's as if when you realize you are on a mortal roller coaster, that's when you realize you deserve more. When you realize that one day the act of life will end. It's kind of very strangely poetic. You know, the poet Rumi says, Before death takes away all that is given, give away all there is to give. You know? That's the key. You know, there's um, <clears throat> this quote could potentially be from Cher could be Cherokee, or I don't know from, or it could be from Eastern cultures. I don't know the specific um, roots of the um, this quote I'm going to share with you, but it was a phrase I saw online, and it said that when the child is born, the world laughs and sm celebrates, the world smiles, and that means the world laughs in joy, a new human being is, has been added to the system. And then it says the child cries. So when the child is born, you know, when the person is born, the world laughs, celebrates, and the child is crying that doesn't know what's going on. Now the quote says, when the man dies, when the person, human being dies, it's as if the world cries. And the child laughs <sighs> you know a lot of people suffer not realizing they are visiting manifestation you are here for such a short time that what else is there? It's literally like a video game with an unknown map. And literally the video game character can't do anything other than go forward. That's it. What truth? What truth are we looking for to hold in a changing world? You see?
One can even say that if the truth wasn't here before man, everything is man-made. So it's as if if truth is surpasses the human idea, because a human being is asking the question, wondering about it, we may never get be able to comprehend an answer beyond the human framework. You see, in this life, you hold back until you see its significance. It's like an emergency. I don't know how many people have lived through an earthquake, but um, there was a four point something earthquake. I think it was four, four point three or something earthquake um, that happened in Iran. And I was in a cottage. I was in the third floor of this uh, cottage, and the railings uh, of the stairs began shaking. The metal railings, you know. In that moment, it was so intense that everybody started to, it was like nobody was stupid. You know, it's like an emergency wakes the fools up. And so it's all about what you deserve. You know, there's times that I have thought about myself and I have, believe it or not, perceived myself from other archetypes. <clears throat> what that means is we think we are just the person in the mirror. Little do we know behind our eyes, there is a simultaneity of multiple perceptions existing at the same time or being experienced at the same time. That means as I'm speaking and as I am watching my physical body here, <clears throat> and for example, the lighter in my hand, I see this is, this is like a certain range of the information accessible but as I am watching literally as I am looking at my hand I am also noticing that the inner realms are simultaneously there the inner realms is like eyes that you don't have the back at the back of your head you have the back of your eyes the inner realm is the world behind your eyes the outer realm is the world in front of it and it is strange it is strange. There is nothing in matter that tells you it's going to become a subject to itself. <clears throat> so the solution to, I mean, of course, later on I'm going to go into a quote tunnel on the word idea of loneliness and see what other scholars have said. But really what it is, is that if you don't understand, if you are not willing to comprehend the value of your own life, why should someone else? You know, it's like after some point, first there's the savior complex. You can say um, children need to be saved. Mankind saves itself. We may be small. We may be about an organism on an anthill. There may be realms unfathomable to us, but, have an, have, but that have an actuality, that have an influence here. My strategy was like, here's the thing. I mean, it's so, com I don't know, to me it's so obvious, but I don't know, maybe I have to explain it in the sense that it's as if the puzzle pieces are on the table. If you have ever made a puzzle, you put all the pieces on the puzzle, you turn around so you see the face of each, then as all the puzzle pieces are spread out, you start building them. Now, civilization is strange. It's like we have all the puzzle pieces in position, but we are not connecting them. We're choosing not to care. We're choosing to enjoy our inner spheres more than caring for this outer sphere that is the rare opportunity. You see, if the mind is not an object, you don't have to worry about it. But if the mind, if the body is an object, you got to worry about it, you know? I would tell you, people forget, if you think you are the same person, you will miss out on your own life. Every day you wake up, there's new factors, new variables. Literally, if one tiny thing changes about the system, you're not the same self. That means <clears throat> if you're going to, let's say, give a talk in public and somebody comes and says something to you right before you give a talk, that literally changes you. For me, it's like 8 billion human beings, 8 billion puzzle pieces. Now, should we care to connect these puzzle pieces, see what kind of an advanced civilization emerges, or should we hide beyond walls that we will, we, it's impossible to hide in this world. Time will find you. You can try to play hide and seek with nature. 
nature doesn't care nature doesn't play hide and seek you know you cannot hold yourself back because nature doesn't hold itself back we have to realize that our ancestors what depression what stress what uh, what isolation in the room literally the dude was like barely starting a family barely having resources to be alive back in the day in some village in the middle of the night suddenly there would be knocks on the door shouting and there they'd say like all right the village is the kingdom is under siege so imagine you were like a baker Imagine you were a baker and in the middle of the night suddenly you had to go to war and do something. Our ancestors, they needed to have an inner firmness that when war came they could defend their own kingdoms. Now people, they cannot even defend their own inner kingdom. It's as if like it's easier not to be part of the equation because then you don't have to do anything. But the whole point of life is to do something here while you can. The poet Rumi says, I died as a mineral and I became a plant. This dude said this 700 years ago. He said, I died as a mineral and I became a plant. I died as a plant and I rose to animal. I died as an animal and I was man. When was I less by dying? Why should I fear death? I shall die once more as man to soar with angels blessed. But even from angelhood, I must pass on to that which no mind has conceived. Now, I'm just going to give a commentary on what Rumi means when he says, I, I will die once more as man to soar with angels blessed. The archetype of the angel is that the divine will, I was mentioning this earlier, that the divine will, in an earlier talk today, that angel, the archetype of the angel has no will of its own. So we are evolving, when it says to soar with angels blessed, we are evolving into a collective will. And then he says, I shall, uh, and he says, um, I will die once more as man to soar with angels blessed, but even from angelhood I must pass on to that which no mind has ever conceived. That means we know what evolution is doing. It is trying to climb the peak of manifestation towards the inconceivable. And when it gets to the inconceivable, conception is not instruction anymore. Right now, it's like if language, if somebody sees beyond language, matter is still an instruction. What that means is, <clears throat> whether you want to see it linguistically or not, when it starts raining, that's literally nature giving a command, you know? And you can stand in the rain and be like, I'm suffering! I'm suffering! Why is this life so cold? You know, and sometimes the only thing you got to do is just instead of saying, I'm suffering, I'm suffering, get out of the rain by realizing you have to pilot your attention. You know, because if somebody else uh, found a strategy to another person's life, then what's the point of that other person being themselves? You know, if everybody has to believe the same thing, what's the point? What's the point? Are we trying to clone our way towards happiness? You know, ideological cloning is going on. Really what it is, is event building. Experiential event building is going to be the superior um, task of the future, I find. That means event designers. That's what the world needs. As we finish past simulations, we must uh, open new ones. Your loneliness, if you're street smart, is a blessing, is a gift. You use it. Moments where life isolates you, you watch. You learn. You watch the world from the stands. And then there's moments where life brings you on the court and then uh, the ball's in your hand, you know? We are evolving towards that which we don't know. Does anybody know their future? I don't think so. I mean, we know some things about the future, of course, but we don't know how it's going to happen. That's why I'm sticking around. That's why I started to not love the world like an artificial child, you know? It's like, yeah, I love everything to perfection. It's like, yeah, if it was that easy. I mean, of course, love has its place, but love is a long-term view. That means many things in the short term, if you have the mindset of love, you cannot handle it. You don't even have the energy for it, you know. 
but the love is the quality of your nature that means some people they have understood love as behavior some people have understood love as their as a quality of a natural being that once you rise so does your species you know in my inner realms a vision has visited me a couple times that has caused oceans to form behind my eyelids and what the vision is is just an emotion of intense speed it's literally as if like a civilization is reaching a very important threshold and it's like multidimensional it's like multidimensional beings are running towards earth we don't see it we think it's empty because that's the easiest thing to do you know anybody who doesn't leave the the room of manifestation they're in of course you're limited to what's in that room just because we're in one room of a house and it's empty does it mean all rooms of the house are empty all rooms of this cosmic house you see we have different cultural programs to be honest I'm a person who was divided between cultures when I go to Iran I feel Canadian <laughs> When I'm in Canada, I feel a bit Iranian, you know, but these are cultural program as if the mind is like a phone that has different applications open. And in this moment, this language is its application, because let me tell you, after you speak a while, <laughs> after you give, you, you, you use the faculty of speech, it becomes second nature. When language becomes second nature, that means imagine someone writing so many sentences that they don't have to think of how they hold the pen anymore. They don't have to think about their handwriting. It just, it just becomes emotional control. So I can honestly tell you many things that at first it was a conscious process that I had to actually look at and be like, all right, this leads to this, this that leads to that, you know. Then it became second nature, and that's the value of man. I mean, biologically, it's called the set principle, where, for example, if somebody has to work night shifts, then it becomes a situation where their body adjusts to their behavior. So our minds are sculpting, or our, your attitude and behavior is like a command to the army of cells that are making you so there's moments where of course there is physical turbulence in this life but whenever that happens I honor my body that means I don't know I don't know how there's still people in the world who uh, they haven't gotten over their existence yet yeah you exist that's basic everybody exists that's the starting ground right in existence there's no value literally it's like a pen where the tip of the pen is touching an empty page but the pen is not moving now who moves this pen who moves this mind that is generating words is it the individual or is it the cosmos is is mr within speaking to you right now is a person speaking to you right now or is it nature am i the world talking to you right now or am i mr within or could it be that we are both that the self is actually alive as the world and so how do we acknowledge this and for me mythology was like a strange guardian angel of my intellect that any time anything would be locking down towards a materialistic perspective legends will rise you know what that means is the person was about to believe that there was nothing else in this world aside from just the manifest modern now and then suddenly the person noticed a hammer falling from the sky and then lightning came as if Zeus had finally found a way to become an eagle so I am telling you that this world is not meant to be hundred percent known and it is at the same time not meant to be hundred percent unknown
but the human mind is surfing between the two, an oscillation between, rather than us thinking we're one person, I honestly think the mind is, when I say oscillate, I mean vibrating, literally left, right, left, right, left, right, all right? So, so what I mean by that is that it's as if like our minds are, we, what we think is the person is actually a transition of attention from being everything and nothing, everything, nothing, everything, nothing, everything, nothing. It's as if we don't realize we're blinking all the time. You know, so literally the the brain is getting refreshed, 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 you know what I mean? Like it's like refreshing your web browser, right? So that is happening every time we inhale, uh, sorry, every time we blink, but then there's the inhalation. So I can tell you that there's been states of, um, just like how poetry suddenly it becomes rhythmic and it takes hold of itself, the spirit of rhetoric is trusted and the moment moves on its own. Similarly, <clears throat> I can say there's been moments in my own uh, noticing of my inner space through meditative sittings in nature, just random moments where I just saw an image in my mind where I'm like sitting beside a tree and so I went and saw the tree and I sat beside it, you know, and there was no objective, you see, there was no mission. At mission and goals and ambitions, they are relevant to time. So as long as I'm existing as an individual, sure, let's have dreams, goals, aspirations and all that. But the moment the attention navigates, into either the void verse or either the universe, the singular verse, or the infinite verse, depending on which way it navigates the, or the constitution, the alphabet of the psychology changes in accordance to the inner realm's intensity. So what I mean is that I sat down and I noticed that my breathing has a rhythm, the inhale, exhale, so that suddenly became like ocean waves, my own inhalation, exhalation. But then there was a moment where I started blinking. I began becoming conscious of my bl blinking as if there's the inhale, exhale of the lungs. There's the pulsing of the heart. There's the blinking. Do you know? And so after some point of actually sitting down and watching your own existence take place in a simple moment, you will become very aware that your attention has to do with your breathing. So I would tell you, people um, may, may in the future applaud what I say, but they are applauding my lungs. They're doing the work. The thoughts are just signals. They're in a vision. But it's the biological body that is engaging it. So what that means is man may have a singular body, a body that appears physical in one dimension, but the mind is multidimensional. And if the mind is multidimensional, it explains everything, how we have been able to use language. We are experts in a world we cannot see, yet we are in. You know, somebody once shared this view that in the invisible, uh, in the in, in, in as how the shaman would say the spirit realms, there was a recruiting process. You see, spirituality could be a suggestion that back in the day, guys, spirituality could be a suggestion that back in the day. Insects made so much noise. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I can tell you spirituality and metaphysics could be a suggestion that back in the day our ancestors were experiencing two dimensions. The more we went forward in time, these dimensions separated. What if there is perception? What if our perception is not is multiple dimensions shifting? You see, we have ha we have the idea of like as if the cosmos is a room, and maybe there's different rooms and dimensions. But what if the cosmos is not a set constant? Uh, structure with constraints, what if the dimensions are alive and changing their minds? What if the weather is literally the world thinking? <laughs> Our planet, 
must, we must make the planet our ally. We have made the planet a stranger. We have made ourselves a stranger to our own life. Let me tell you, this is the strategy. Most people think they're stressed and depressed. No, you're not stressed and depressed. You're under attack. You're under attack by your own ignorance. What does that mean? That means it's important in life to have the capacity to notice gentleness and to love the world. But there's a reason the scorpion, the bee, and many creatures, they are armed by natural design. You see, when you look at nature, I've studied animal psychology, you know, aside from just every human being. <laughs> In, and the per human person in the mirror, aside from that sort of animal psychology, <clears throat> I mean, I call them in my books the inferior positions of consciousness. They're not, they're not inferior beings, they're just in an inferior position. When you look at animal psychology, do you know what you see? You see a Zen master. You see some, a creature so in the here and now where I was like, holy, this creature has no sense of what's coming. It just, I mean, it has a sense, but it's moment-based. <clears throat> so it's as if we are evolving through momentary perception, but strangely, the human being can consider different times. Certain scholars consider that it was the future, just this notion that we can think of the future, was discovered. The future was a discovery. We were like, holy shit, we could plan what's going to happen tomorrow. We can p plan parties tomorrow. That was a, do you know what kind of an evolutionary leap that was? Millions of years it took for us to just be able to plan parties in the future. <laughs> <coughs> you suffer because you have accepted the weak without realizing the same moment you are taking to accept yourself as weak is the same moment you have to take to accept yourself as strong. There are some things in the world nature cannot teach. And if you are blessed, it will grab you like a kitten, you know, like the back of a kitten, and lift you from the box you have lived in for so long and throw you into the unknown. You know, I, I, I animate this story. I mean, of course, it's, <laughs> it's something I made, I, I added. But I was saying, imagine Christopher Columbus before, like, his outcomes. When, he, when we were, imagine we were seeing Christopher Columbus as a child before he had done anything, everything he had done later on. We would see Christopher Columbus, imagine his father had died in war. This is, this is not true. I'm just, I'm just sharing, animating a story. I'm saying this is a perspective. Everything I say, I, I, guys, I tend to be very accurate. But some things I animate to see the psychology of the uh, archetypes of the characters in the story. So imagine a young Christopher Columbus, like this young, super, super young kid, and like, let's say, 12-year-old kid, okay? Christopher Columbus. And his father's died and his mother is a widow. And the mother's like, you can't go out of the house. It's too dangerous, Christopher, you know? And imagine Christopher Columbus as a kid just every day looking out the window, looking out the window and being like, holy shit, there's a world out there. You know, that's what the modern hermits have forgotten, that this world is the gift of an evolutionary process. That means the violent person, they don't realize the advanced technology that is being them. If you're violent in this world, you have been a fool before you were born. A dishonest fool. An honest fool, you could bear with that. You know, you could totally, like, the honest fool, believe it or not, hilariously gets into paradise. But the dishonest fool, oh shit, that's like worse of the worst. You know, you are dishonest and yet you are also being foolish. You know? You know what this planet feels like? It feels evolution is at war with its own expectations of itself. Because do you think the trees care about advanced civilizations and sky cities and interstellar um, communities?
Christopher Columbus, the mother, would say, no, Christopher, it's too dangerous. And Christopher Columbus, I feel I gotta be out there, Mom. <laughs> Can you imagine, like, a TV show, Christopher Columbus's life, you know? And he's trying to get out of the box there you're in. And that's the thing. Life is keeping you in a box, and the whole point of living it is to step out of it. And so, you have to get angry at the walls of where you have stayed in for so long. You know, you have to get angry at yourself in order to change yourself, you know? Trust me, I've had moments where I've get, gotten angry at others, and I've, been, I've maintained it. Literally, I've just remained silent, and maybe at most, I, my, my fist shaked a little. <laughs> <clears throat> but... The anger I have released on myself when I've been alone, it, it's never gotten violent because I've, I've had a metaphysical perception. For me, there was nothing. It's like, there was this notion, it's like, what if the person, excuse me for bringing this up, but I think it's important for the discussion, what if the person uses a bridge the wrong way or attempts to end their physical continuity? I thought about this at some point in my life, but not because I had a metaphysical framework. I was like, what if it doesn't end? What if, I, what if the person ends their life and there's another life? So it's as if there's, then there's no point of going in the whole repeat. Do you know? That means it's like Buddhism honestly made me feel like there's no meaning to ending life, actually. <laughs> there's a meaning to figuring out its beginning, though. You know? That means imagine all the violence that is currently going on this planet. Imagine an advanced alien civilization came, and with a snap of a finger, or with the raising of a finger, they managed to make all the violent and cruel people on the planet use that energy for a non-cruel intent. You see, it, it is the case that the system at times can reject the individual, whether it's in the inner realms or the outer realms. Trust me, I have had moments where I have felt the cosmos was riding with me into battle. And moments where it was as if, whether the cosmos was with me or not, my eyes had to march forward. For if man has bigger dreams, then there must be giant awakenings set in the stars. For our minds are starlight powered. Just take this in. We are solar powered. That means the, the view of the soul, I think it's going to be solar. S-U-L-A-R where solar and soul are one, where we realize that light, it is the visible realm. It's as if I do not worship the sun, but I don't know how to thank it. For without these beams, there would be no visible structure. You see, it's, it's like we are designed as a, it's like we're thrown into the, an unknown system and our efforts are to know it. A mystic by by the name Said Norsi. He says, Worry. Sorry, let me find the quote. I, I don't remember it accurately enough. Uh, Said Norsi. Oh, yeah, check this out. So, um, Said Norsi says, Worry is itself an illness, since worry is an accusation against divine wisdom. A criticism of divine mercy. That means anytime you worry, you are actually rejecting the world's spirit, uh, intelligence. You see, it's weird. 
It's as if we want to be our true selves, yet the world appears as a simulation, as endless simulations of cause and effect, probabilities of movement. Do you know? It's as if it's strange. It's as if, like, the person does something, the moment they do something, the world, like a chess, a chess game, literally, it's like karma is the greatest sign that you are not alone in this universal sector. And so I constantly think about it. There's sometimes, I mean, I, I have worried myself, but not for my individual. You worry for your individual life until you realize how short it is. Then you worry about the life of your civilization. You know, it's like it's, a moment comes where you're like, excuse my language, but I was like, who the fuck am I when there's a civilization trying to uh, stand the test of time? Human beings must activate their better life. And that cannot be taught. It must be lived. It must be explored. Your eyes have to change the road they're walking on. And sometimes nature pushes you. I'm telling you, there's moments where grace reigns and there's moments where it's like there's wastelands of arrogance. There's moments, I've, I remember this was pre-2011. Uh, I, I had moments of incredible selfish rage. It wasn't just thinking of myself, but it was anger. It was anger that the outer realms was not like my inner realms. And as long as I expected the outer realms to be like my inner realms, it was as if the inner realms were hollow. It's like, it's strange. Life is, because you're such an incredible natural system, if you just stop doing the wrong thing, most likely the right things happen. Now, what the wrong thing is, it, it has to do with the signs of every individual, because we're treating ourselves like antennas that um, um, they express and receive. We're an antenna that's conscious, it's receiving a signal. We're conscious that there's thought and it's emergence. So anyways, guys, I need to um, actually relocate. The bugs are coming out. So um, uh, just hang in there. I'll be back. Okay, so um, I'm back, guys. Now, let me fly towards the topic. So a loneliness that never existed kind of implies that we were never lonely. So if we were to think how we were never lonely, it has to do with what we're identifying, you know? When you look at it existentially, no, atoms are not lonely. There's atoms everywhere. Existentially, there is no such meaning as loneliness. Everything is just existing. You know, experientially, there is different ways that it can, loneliness may be seen as something, you know. But I'm just saying that when the person realizes that there is a world where there is no meaning, it's just their existence, and then there is another layer the mind literally places upon the world, and that's the level of meaning. So subjective meaning actually has nothing to do with objective matter. Matter, what theory can you have for existence? That means it's as if like something that is just there, it is its own value. 
So we are creating a linguistic value over something that has a value that's so instantaneous that it's like, what can you really say about something that's real? So what really seems to be cool is that language has been an unreal way we have been accepting reality. It's like the person doesn't believe in, for example, uh, mythological gods. But believes in a self out of nowhere. You know, it's, it's like really what it is, is I think we have to become aware of our inner realms. We have to realize that there is two lives being lived. And there's two births. There's the birth as an objective existential creature. And then there is an awakening to the individualism, the free will, the birth of the conscious being, the conscious entity. You know, it's like the person looks at their body and you're like, what's the purpose of life? The purpose of the legs are to move. The purpose of the hands are to create something. You know, the purpose of the mouth, it, when you look at it existentially, it's, uh, the purpose of everything is obvious. But it's only when we wonder about what is the role of an experiencer and what if that language has a glitch. Language has a mystical glitch in it. Let's call this the mystical glitch in language. Sometimes the mo one of the most beautiful moments of my life was when I was completely alone, when there was nothing in the world that was trying to understand me. It was as if it was just like an energetic experience. You know, guys, I'm going to go into a quote tunnel of loneliness. Let's see um, what history has in store for us you know a quote tunnel for those who are new it's pretty much me reading a bunch of quotes from people back in the day um, to see how their inner realms uh, their inner realms uh, saw the world how what kind of world uh, others have been living in There we go. Top 10 loneliness quotes. The top 10. <laughs> Bertrand Russell. Love is something far more than desire for sexual intercourse. It is the principal means of escape from the loneliness which afflicts most men and women throughout the greater part of their lives. It's as if it's uh, Bertrand Russell is saying to the Hikikomori that um, you got to love your way out of your isolation. There's no other way. If you don't care for this world, you can't live in it. You know, and so it's a strange situation where for a long time we have to care for the unknown potential of the species and act civilized until it can make its next great chess move. The Dalai Lama says too much self-centered attitude you see brings you see isolation. Result, loneliness, fear, anger. The extreme self-centered attitude is the source of suffering. That means some of the most loneliest people on this planet are some of the most selfish people on this planet because they have chosen their inefficient self, the desire of their inefficient self over the desires of their efficient self. You know, there is a self-centering that the person has understood the nature of the self, so they're always centered in it. Then there is a self-centering where the person is reacting to the impact of some overwhelming this, um, something that's different, you know. So that means if you start caring for your civilization, 
you'll see if you here's the thing if right now I thought just for myself I'd be like okay why do I want to give a talk right now you know I'm just gonna go like uh, sleep you know <laughs> But the thing is, when I think about something that surpasses the echo of my own existence, it's just living for the potential of the future. What else can we do? You know? Maya Angelou, an incredible writer. She says, music was my refuge. I could crawl into the space between the notes and curl my, curl my back to loneliness. The thing about music, guys, is that it evokes the inner realms. It's like an event. It's like when you listen to a good song, you're seeing a film behind your eyes, you know, an emotional film. William Slim, the dominant feeling of the battlefield is loneliness. Actually, for, weak, for warriors that don't know the overall command. Because the battlefield is actually where camaraderie is born. It's not a, it, 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 you can say it's the only ironic place where you're not lonely, but you die alone. Naomi Campbell says, anger is a manifestation of a deeper issue. And that, for me, is based on insecurity, self-esteem, and loneliness. Anger is someone who didn't allow themselves to be emotional, vulnerable. So for years, a mindset has been just uh, like, a, like a slingshot holding about an intense uh, unauthorization. You see, there's some things that you just have to um, think of it this way. Nobody knows what the victory's outcome is, but... It doesn't matter if you lose or win when the battles don't stop. Do you see what I mean? So it's the overall victory. So for me, when I speak to people or in any sort of communication or social thing, how would I say it? For me, it's like, it's like chess. If I input something into the moment, I am moving the moment. If I don't input something in the moment, the moment moves itself. So you can say, um, if you care for something more than yourself, you will see beyond yourself. But if everything has to just be the thought you have, and there's an empty handedness on the road ahead. Let me tell you what the true joy of living is. It is running into the unknown and performing the dance that you have been waiting for for eons. For, t for an eternity. Because really, it's a silly place. Like a rock in the middle of nowhere, eight billion ants on it. It's a silly, it's silly. You know? <laughs> so there's nothing normal about the world, you know? When we feel lonely because we feel isolated or different from the environment, you have to, you're a different DNA. You know, it'd be weird. And can you imagine how weird life would be if you, everywhere you went to, everybody already knew your inner realm, your mind, you know? You see, there's, there's a technique I learned from master painters is that they draw in a way where you see what they did, but you can never see what they did. That is... very close to throwing Thor's hammer back into the sky, you know, and Thor's like, thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Seattle says, what is man without the beasts? For if all the beasts were gone, man would die of a great loneliness of the spirit. Franz Kafka my peers lately have found companionship through means of intoxication. It makes them sociable. I, however, cannot force myself 
to use drugs to cheat on my loneliness. It is all that I have. And when the drugs and alcohol dissipate, will be all that my peers have as well. So you see, it's not really about... I would say you are, you just have to look at life like a designer before you have stories judging things. When stories, when character, when you, when you go into a psychology of a character, an emotional landscape opens up. So if I think of myself as this kind of person in this kind of situation, then emotions are going to constantly be there. But when you hover, not hover, but when you notice that your dual eyes are being witnessed non-dually, it becomes a situation where you're noticing a part of your intelligence that has nothing to do with another part of your intelligence. George Eliot says, what loneliness is more lonely than distrust? Yeah, if you don't trust the world, you're pretty much on an island. C.S. Lewis says, look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. Holy shit. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. I don't know if C.S. Lewis was the person who wrote Narnia. Was that C.S. Lewis? Or I think I'm, um, that's, that could be someone else. But if this man is, is a fiction writer, then technically he's, it's like, there's a bit of blasphemy. <laughs> No, I think what he means is that the notion of look for Christ meant was Christ was an archetype of truth. That means if you look for what is true in your life, um, hatredness, hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay, they, would be, they will be a shadow that's behind you, not a shadow you're looking at, perhaps. Anyways, interesting quote. Next quote. Mother Teresa, holy shit, Mother Teresa just jumped into the room. Loneliness and feeling of being unwanted is the most terrible poverty. It's not just the most terrible poverty, it's the most ineff inefficient expression of a species. If you feel lonely when there's 8 billion people on the planet, it's like, it's like, what are you doing? Like Sebastian Maniscalco says, what are you doing? <laughs> What can be said? We are born alone, but we have the opportunity to not die alone, to experience the life of the species before the candle out, uh, max, uh, wax melts, you know, before the biological energy carrier is in, 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 incapable. You see, of course, skill has to do with energy, but it has to do with the passion of the vision you see. So... If you care for something, your intelligence has uh, is treating it like an ally. So is it's, it's like you are considering a sort of comfort. You know, <clears throat> there's many sounds in this world. Some right, some wrong. Just like there's different colors, you know, it's like honestly what nationalism is, is we've painted the face of the world and we've named it and we're, we don't realize that this sphere has enough to make every nation, uh, make every nation's hunger full. That means there was something in um, this model, I, it's this idea, pretty much my life's work, Civilization 2.0. In this idea, I'm suggesting that we're going to go live in sky cities for 2,000 years. That's phase one. Phase two, we're going to heavenize the earth, earth heaven. And then phase three, we're going to either choose to go towards an interstellar advancement or an advancement beyond the language threshold. That means either we're going to step out of the room of conception. That means there would be, we would have understood so much about the world that we cannot be separate from it anymore. But I'm predicting that potentially 10,000 years if, if cyberspace takes a different route. It depends what cyberspace does. Right now, the cyberspace uh, culture is just we're in the pioneer phase. All these gamers don't realize. They are like they are building the history of uh, a world inside a world. You know? This is why it's... Um, you know what it is? It's like... 
Honestly, I don't know. I feel like the internet is like 2012, the movie, that giant ship everybody's trying to get on. And you're just trying to write on the walls of this giant ship, you know, what happened in life, you know. You know, guys, I'm going to do something out of the blue. I'm going to read for you a chapter out of a book I haven't published. And I wrote in 2015. <clears throat> the book is called The Source of Language. And I could tell you 2015 was the most continental philosopher uh, inner realm experiential year of my life. I can tell you that the years 2014 to 2000, I mean, even until now, but I could say 2014 to 2016, those years of my life, I was, um, technically, I felt I wasn't in this world. There was no time. It's as if, imagine a piano player that just wants to play this melody he's just seen in his inner realms to, at such a fast speed that it's like all notions of time go away. The significance, the importance of the living moment is a command where that's where, the, 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 I, I would say, um, uh, the celestial commanders behind our eyes, you know, their voices are echo from there. That behind our eyes, the landscape has incredible multidimensional potential. You know, that means I thought the moment I, my mind opened up, I remember as a kid, I, I had this closet that would open from the inside, the doors would open up from the inside and it had two mirrors on it. So it was like, literally, I would see myself in like the infinite reflection of myself, the hollow infinite reflection. And it was a moment where my mind started to fathom what the significance, like years later, of course, I started to think that the parallel possibility of the dimension means we can never know. That means imagine we figure out everything in this universe, then we're like, oh shit, there's another universe. Then we go figure out everything in that, then we see there's another, 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 another. It's as if the only thing left is to just comprehend infinity from our corner. Because regardless of the room you're in, uh, you can step in many rooms, but until you realize who's walking, the room defines you. So let me find this thing. Source of language, this book. So I'm going to read for you a few chapters from this um, pretty much I wrote this book uh, the source of language through different entries pretty much I wrote a bunch of essays and I compiled them all you know just poetic oriented essays you know so um, here it goes this is chapter four of the source of language the insolvable quest. The insolvable quest is not a surrender to a conceptual devotion that faith trusts. The design of thought must begin to be observed, must begin to be observed with the question of, in quotations, who am I? And when sincere self-inquiry has been engaged, reality will melt like melting snow in the sun that is the brightener, that is the brightener of our material world. Whose hands have kept the great candle in the sky? Our nature as, is, as, our nature as is observed to be an angel with four wings 
Infinite feathers shall remind us of the movements of destiny, needed for a lift off into the final realization of the Supreme Self, sincerely your moment. When a broken world finally closes its eyes within the realms of your consciousness, your fantasy has become more than a fantastic vision, but also a sword of divine light in the shadowy dark halls of ignorance's resistance. Many shall realize the whole cosmos is within the whole cosmos. In the personality, there are many foundations for rules. In the awareness of an omnipresent and omniscient self, there are... There is no other truth. Do not chase the butterfly of mysticism, but let the divine find you. Beyond our forehead, existence has always been in one place. Who can read these words and see reality for what it really is? Command greatness, for it shall be your commander first. Around and in the center of your vision, the circle of life never needed degrees. Is fascination unborn, or is life lived beyond the De devils, I don't know what I wrote here, the devil's ignorance. Language is the paint for a masterpiece beyond words. Do not doubt the one and only God. Reveal to yourself a nature that has always been alive. The whole point is you are beyond words. So within your true nature, transcend yourself. Enlightenment is like a stepping stone. Enlightenment is like a stepping stone. It won't happen until you're sure where to aim to. Step wisely in time and space. Are memories skydiving out of your eyes? Chaos and order are more than just a game of light and its absence. <clears throat> you're not getting warmer or colder. You just require to realize that you are already here. Is your intelligence separate from the universe? I don't think so. That's the point. <laughs> That's how the essay ends. And I forgot to mention, guys, there's quotes at the... Okay, actually, it's not. This is the draft, so the quotes aren't there. The next chapter is called The God Within the Animal. I'm going to read that and probably move on after. The God Within the Animal, Chapter 5 of The Source of Language. Again, for those who are new, um, this was written in 2015. I wrote this in 2015. The God Within the Animal. It can be said, the body is an animal, your mind is God. Or rather, your body is made of earth, and your mind is made of sky. Therefore, all communication can be said to be the communication and movement between the earth and sky, the body and mind, and the animal and God. Eastern mysticism shines upon the view of the world that it is an unspeakable organism beyond the description of its parts. What that means is that from the shadows you cannot discover the true nature of the sun. Let us find the enlightenment that is quicker than light. For if you were an artist that wanted to draw your greatest memory of existence on a canvas ready for visual paint, how the world happens is quite the most, ba the most beautiful thing. Many think life is about its length, but it is about its depth. The depth of life experience is a suggestion that when you wonder what is the best way to live life, it will be said you can get lost in a game of duality, which is the unhidden world that language walks on, or you can liberate yourself from how if you were to think beyond thought, there would be no thinker. Suddenly, the words of language have finally found themselves transparent to the world of direct experience. How you acknowledge this moment is important because every idea that you have on your moment will create an unconscious cycle of karma. 
In other words, language and art for the conscious self-aware being can no longer be separate. How the moment must be acknowledged is that when you ask, in quotations, who is asking, or in quotations, who is the seer of thought, uh, or how is, or how is, in quotations, there, also in quotations here, question mark. The source of language is always beyond what the language is. Here in the, in the essay, guys, I refer to my own YouTube chat. <laughs> So, as Mr. Within has said, the letters of the alphabet are not enough. This universe is not a tangible fixed concept or idea and it will never be. For as long as we have imagination, science cannot have the loudest voice. A self-reflective divine direct experience will suddenly, through the gates of silence and stillness, very intensely tear up egotistical conclusions about reality. In a presence in which if you looked in your morning mirror, you would not see yourself as separate from the universe, but as the whole universe is one moment of absolute being. Are the letters in the alphabet enough? Enlightenment is stepping out of time to a self-reflection beyond time. No two people would be one person, for there would be... For there would just be one person. When you flow with your true nature, that is this whole moment. Oh, excuse me. When you flow with your true nature, that is this whole moment. You don't connect too many ide ideologies to self. For self is your pure moment, always as it was. There is no supreme idea, I idea of a hierarchical intelligence with anger issues. <laughs> The God of the heart is the best God, for it beats at the, as, as the center of the breathable, breathable universe. Behind the eyes of ideas, there is no third eye of an enlightened master. There is the beauty of a moment that is its own mirror. Polished by nature, we are all divinity's work. If you look, clo if you look closely at these letters, you will see they are artwork. For abstraction is only pushed back by society's reality. For language was the smudge, and direct experience is the glory wiping the mirror of vision. The mind, conceptually, is void but rich with subjective design. Has a thought taken off its mask? Has your solar presence realized it was never an individual soul, and the teacup had to be empty before it's full? Can Zen masters breakdance? <laughs> but I've written breakdance as if breakdance. You know, there's the space of being. Are words fighting back? The mystery of conception always points to an axis unconsciously thrown into the endless abyss of the unknown. Is your personality an unnecessary scene for your true presence? What has the Buddha said that we have not listened to? Whose story is history? Transcendence means direct experience is all that is happening. Beyond planes of action, the wise man listens to the self beyond words, in which sincerity has made too humble to hurt a dying world. How do the eternal behave to temporal rudeness? Don't stay thirsty, my friends. Just walk omnisciently as your true nature. Imagination and technology are the horses. If logic, rationality, and divine intuitive intelligence are the chariot. No wonder, now wonder, dear reader. Who is sitting in this grand picture that is the chariot of this moment? What is the texture, what is the texture of your experience? Or have you not playfully discovered the oneness of love yet? For in selfless devotional service, like the tree outside, to our moment we shall live without prior karmic disturbances boomerang from insincere moments of unnecessary actions of thoughts. A smart man looks in front of him. A wise man is the whole moment that sees. Beyond ordinary perception, just like the stars promised, we are extraordinary. Creativity means on the surface of the rock there are flows of communicating intelligence. As if if our consciousness was a drop of intelligence, it is rather present through a river of multidimensional intelligence. So beyond the conception of ideology, that with a simple awareness to what is within us, we have not only become the source of language, but the source of all light. There are two ways to look at our world in regards to a multidimensional context. Either we are within another world, or another world is within us. It seems the cosmic fractal in nature, in nature of the body never stopped growing. Wisdom originates from self-reflection. Trust the moment, and let the divine smile.
You and the whole life, you are the whole life, not a part of it. You're not a spinning rock in the middle of nowhere. You, in caps, are your moment. Beyond these words, you are your own enlightenment. We must conduct our consciousness with the full, aware, full awareness of our whole moment, regardless of how multidimensional. Oh my God, how long is this? <laughs> uh, we must conduct our consciousness with the, <laughs> with the. We must conduct our consciousness with the full awareness of our whole moment, regardless of how multidimensional or not it would be. <clears throat> the pilots of consciousness are here to navigate as the whole moment of existence. Cough, cough. In brackets. That, include, that includes enlightenment too. How much do you trust the intelligence that you are beyond language? How does Pegasus fly and ride the floating fields of paradise at the same time? Perhaps if you stop thinking you are a thought that gets wounded by this, this association, realize you're not a thought and you never were. You're a moment of existential experience, untouchable by all that is, for it is defined based and by all of it. Sorry, guys. <clears throat> to continue. All right, where was I? How does Pegasus fly and ride the floating fields of paradise at the same time? Perhaps if you stop thinking you're a thought that gets wounded by this association. Realize you're not a thought and you never were. You're a moment of existential experience, untouchable by all that is. Sorry, guys. <laughs> moment bless yourself <clears throat> perhaps if you stop thinking you're a thought I read that um, realize you're not a thought and you never were you're a moment of existential experience untouchable by all that is for it is defi defined based and by all of it my beloved friend you are your own torchbearer God is already its own exploration if you only think you are a creator in brackets I've written self you will build blindly be your moment there's nothing simpler than that are you reading this book or self-reflectively observing how the nature of your own mind emanates into reality? Be sincere and the seer of all sin is beyond sin. You are the path. There is nothing else. You are the path. There is nothing else. And literally, guys, there's no other sentences at the end of the chapter. There's nothing else. <laughs> So all that I can say is that um, treat this world as nature's artwork where you have become suddenly conscious of a part of it. You know, nobody knows who we will be. This is why there's nothing to literally fear because nobody knows enough to fear. <laughs> so anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Um, I will share the Discord link. And if it's not busy, I will fly off the cyberspace branch. Yeah, 
Yeah. Thanks for listening. Blessings. And uh, I guess one last thing I can say. When a civilization achieves its dream, it awakens like a caterpillar into the advanced civilization of the butterfly. Rise, mankind, rise.